My area of interest is in finding better ways to treat acute and chronic pain for children as well as adults. All of the limitations of current pain medications and the limitations of current local anesthetics are problematic for adults, but even more so for children. So it was very natural to advance how we take care of children after major surgeries. Thanks very much, Irene. I'm gonna talk uh, about work uh, involving my lab and our colleagues on developing a new local anesthetic, neosaxitoxin, that we believe can improve the course of patients after many kinds of surgery. Surgery and anesthesiology have developed as fields a lot since the 1840s. Nevertheless, surgery is still painful for many patients. There's a number of ways of treating pain after surgery, but many of them have side effects and risks, and you're all familiar with the risks shown here of opioid analgesics. Local anesthesia was first brought from South America to Europe and North America in the 1880s, but the drugs we have now are minimally different over that time period. From the amino esters first to since the 1940s, the amino amides, they are rather simple molecules, uh, and they're constrained both by chemical constraints as well as physical chemical constraints having to do with their diffusion in both aqueous and lipid environments. The predominant intended site of action of local anesthetics is on voltage-gated sodium channels. We know a lot more about sodium channel subtypes in the last 20 years and know a lot more about targeting subtypes. Nevertheless, the drugs we have now are very nonspecific and fairly crude in their actions. We use local anesthetics for many uses every day, for being the sole anesthetic for some types of procedures, for infiltration in wounds both in the surface and deep structures to reduce pain after surgery. And the field of regional anesthesia has really transformed in the last 10, 15 years, in part because the use of ultrasound makes technical success at placing needles where you want them much less of the problem. Increasingly, the limitation is not putting local anesthetic in the right place, it's the limitations of the medications that we have today. Nevertheless, there's good outcomes of local and regional anesthesia uh, already from the agents we have and the somewhat technologic approaches to delivering them. So in randomized trials and systematic reviews, in many situations they lead to improved pain scores, sparing of opioid requirements, accelerated recovery parameters, improvements in a number of long-term outcomes, and for specific high-risk groups of patients, improvements in measures of major morbidity and mortality. Nevertheless, the drugs we have now, which have not changed much in the last 60 years, are not ideal. They're limited by, again, physical chemical as well as chemical constraints. If you have a major operation, you hurt for many days. Existing local anesthetics injected into a site wear off typically in about 10 hours. Sometimes it may be longer, sometimes shorter. That's not long enough to cover pain after many types of surgery. We can place indwelling catheters, but they tether the patient to an infusion pump, they migrate, they introduce costs and inconveniences. In addition, they cause risks and harm, so that if you give an excessive dose, particularly to an infant, if you inject in a blood vessel, you can get seizures, cardiac arrest, and difficulty with resuscitation. So all this is a way of saying that it's a natural thing that somebody who trained in pediatrics, trained in anesthesiology, and started as I did as a junior attending in doing pediatric and anesthesiology and intensive care would get interested in this as a problem. And uh, I started uh, becoming interested in pain management in children in, area, in an era when few people took that on. And myself and Neville Sethan and several colleagues started our pain service, which has evolved over the years to be the clinically busiest and academically most productive pediatric pain program in the world. And I started a laboratory uh, when I had my long clinical training, came back to being an attending physician, and got interested in, could you make a better local anesthetic? And I had the good fortune to find collaborators. So early approaches involved collaboration with Bob Langer, who many of you know, regarding controlled release of existing local anesthetics and microparticles. And that approach got into phase two trials, but there's some limitations of that and some reasons why we began looking for new molecules or adapted uses of old molecules. 
Um, Dan Kohane, who's shown there on the upper left, uh, was a critical care fellow who became interested in, in this with me, and uh, he's gone from being fellow working with me now to full professor and director of a highly innovative lab on biomaterials at Children's. Um, and we collaborated also with Gary Strickharts at Brigham and Women's. But we became interested in a class of molecules known as the site one sodium channel blockers that are derived from puffer fish, cyanobacteria, dinoflagellates. These molecules have very high potency on isolated nerve, up to 10,000 times the potency of lidocaine. They are not toxic to tissues, unlike high concentrations of existing local anesthetics. They bind to subtypes of sodium channels, but not others, and particularly not the predominant channel in the heart. They don't cause seizures. There were reasons why they were not workable at the time as local anesthetics, and so we began a program of studying how to develop usable formulations. And for what I'm going to show you next, sciatic nerve block in a rat is a standard simple model. And I would say in drug development of many kinds of drugs, prediction from a mouse model of depression or a mouse model of dementia to human depression or dementia is difficult. Numbness in a rat, numbness in a mouse is rather similar to numbness in a human. And numbness in a volunteer has reasonable prediction for surgical pain relief in an incision uh, in an innervated area. Not complete, but reasonable. So early on, we looked at some of the existing site one blockers, showed that combinations of them with existing local anesthetics were incredibly synergistic. So on the z-axis there is duration of numbness to a thermal stimulus, and we showed that if you combine a site one blocker with bupivacaine, the standard, you get incredibly synergistic prolongation of action. We showed that epinephrine, the vasoconstrictor, left shifts a dose response curve considerably, allows you to get efficacy with much smaller dose, and that there was a profound prolongation of blockade by epinephrine. For bupivacaine, it's about a 20%, 30% prolongation. For, the, for epinephrine and other alpha agonists, it could be up to tenfold. So we did a lot of receptor pharmacology. We did a lot to understand mechanism, looked at models of animals having surgery, nerve injury, inflammation, and so forth. But initially had trouble getting this to, uh, translated into commercial development. And we'd taken other formulations into trials. To jump ahead a little, we looked at a subclass of these site one blockers called the saxitoxin series, did some structure activity work, and one particular member of it, neosaxitoxin, was the most potent of the series. And we we're able to show that combinations of neosaxitoxin, bupivacaine, and eventually epinephrine gave that the three way combination gave six fold prolongation over the two way, and that you could get more than tenfold longer analgesia with that three way compared to the existing standard bupivacaine. Now we take a step sideways, and we had done this work, we'd published papers, and a group in Chile looked, and we had filed patents. So when Irene talks about steps in the process, patents had been filed. The group in Chile at the university was, had a longstanding interest in a variety of marine toxins and their biologic effects. Chile has a huge fishing and shellfish industry, a huge need to understand them. And there was also a very informal process of taking new drugs and testing them in animals and in humans. They, to make a long story short, did phase one trials, a phase two superiority trial where they showed better pain scores and even better global recovery parameters compared to the standard. About the time that they went through this, they had formed a small biotech company, Proteus, and it became apparent to them that you can't develop a drug in Chile first, that no drug has ever started there and gone to the market. And oh, by the way, there were patents from these folks in Boston who had tried to contact them to collaborate. And so they agreed to collaborate with us. And we went to the FDA and said together, this was a very non-standard development process. Here's how we propose to do all the steps in between with careful large animal pharmacology, toxicology, GLP work, relevant physiology, some at children, some at CROs, a PK assay, when you have a microgram drug and you have to m measure PK in the picogram range, it took connections to Doug Berthume uh, at Waters Instruments to get a next generation mass spec machine to do it. 
in a sheep model, we showed that even deliberate massive IV overdose did nothing to their heart. That unlike bupivacaine, where your heart would have stopped cold, nothing happened. So the FDA approved an investigator-initiated IND, which was completed, done at Children's with young adults in the Clinical Research Center. It won Best Abstract Award at the Major Academic Meeting of Anesthesiologists, publications in their journal this month with preclinical, clinical article, cover, and editorial. And we showed durations of numbness and durations of what would be a surrogate for clinical pain relief that would ex be expected to be about eight times longer than existing local anesthetics, with a reasonable expectation of having two to three days of very good pain relief from a single injection. We showed plasma kinetics in a reasonable profile and the effect of epinephrine in blunting an early rise in blood level. Along the way on all of this, Tito, led by Irene's predecessors and then Irene coming on after, and with Raj Kunkun being the project officer who logged thousands and thousands of, article, uh, of hours, we have licensed this to Grunenthal, represented by Judy Ashworth, who's there, a company that's had a long focus on treatment of pain and a focus on taking the long path to developing drugs. And so we are now partners with them and with our collaborators in Chile towards the next set of clinical trials and hopefully to licensure worldwide. I think that prolonged local anesthetics have the potential to radically improve how we treat pain after surgery, both in developed countries where we have the kind of fancy technologies, but in the developing world where there's technology in the operating room, but then you might have one nurse with 70 patients on the ward and you're not gonna get a dose of pain med and you're not gonna have an infusion pump. I think neosaxitoxin and the lines of research around it are a promising way to improve how we treat pain after surgery. I hope I've convinced you that drug development takes some time and persistence, and that this would not have been possible except for the unique kind of resources and collaborations here at Children's Hospital. And in particular, when I've said we, it includes at least all the people shown here, the collaborators I've mentioned earlier, Joe Crivero, PI of the trial, um, Kim Lobo, the project coordinator, but I wanna mention Tito's role in this all the way. Um, I had early funding on this from NIH in early phases, but funding as it got more towards technology development was from Children's Tech Dev Fund from my department under Paul Hickey's leadership, which took a risk and decided to support this program overall, but support the phase one trial. And finally, to two very generous uh, visionary philanthropists, uh, Sarah Page Mayo and Dick Mayo for their support and endowment. Thanks very much for your attention.